we'll start with a little uh, episode. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! Do you feel that way about the gold market? Well, so do I. And I just want to start off by talking about why I think the gold market's coming off the bottom and going higher, and then I'll get on to McEwen Mining. First, this is just a, a chart showing the monetary expansion that's occurred around the world. Um, you have the Bank of China in red on the top, then the, then the Swiss, the Euro, the dollar, the Federal Reserve. Everybody's been expanding their money supply, trying to get the economy going. And that amount of money is coming into the system and is really driving the broad market higher as interest rates are so, they're almost, there's nothing there. This is looking at financial assets as a percentage of uh, disposable income. And it's looking from 1971 forward. And you can see there's some peaks in there, the dot-com bubble in 99, first on the left. And we're moving into a space that is very rarefied, where financial assets are becoming more and more dominant. And as they're getting more and more dominant, you're looking at real assets, precious metals, farmland. This is looking at a scale over on the left is 1925. So you're looking at about 92 years of history, and this is the lowest point in that time frame in which you have real assets that low. What it's saying is that equities are very expensive relative to real assets. Moving here is a chart that I find very interesting. The dark blue is the gold price as quoted in a basket of international major trading currencies. And the bottom gold is gold in dollars. And, what's, and it's going from 19, or sorry, 2011 to present. And this graph is just saying that when you look around the world, if you look at gold in other currencies, it's not too far off its high. It's not what we saw in the dollar going from $1,920 an ounce down to $1,277 today. In other currencies, it's very close to the highs that were achieved back in 2011. This graph, if you went back to 2001, would be the reverse. From 2001 to 2005, it was gold going up in the dollar, so it would have been the upper line, and the bottom was gold in the major currencies around the world. So we've had this reversal. And when gold started moving in all currencies back in 2005, it started running much higher. And you can see the bottom line here, gold in dollar terms, appears to have formed a bottom right here. And it's heading up. And to me, that's one of the encouraging signs in this market. This is looking at two gold cycles. The bull market in the 70s from 1970 through to 80 and it's in this gold color and this is from 2001 to now. It's a very similar line going up, peaking, plateauing and then looking like it might want to turn higher. This is looking at the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index so all commodities, relative to divided by the S&P 500 index. And you can see here, here, and here was a low point. And at those points in the, those cycles, equities were considered very expensive and commodities very cheap. This is just looking at debt relative to the GDP 
And again, we're at record levels in historic terms. For those of you looking at the precious metal space for the first time, just an illustration of what happens on corrections and then in bull markets. So bear markets here, 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 and then these strong runs up. In the 70s, it was a 1,300% increase in the gold price. Now I'm just looking at the Barron's Gold Mining Index. There's been a little work. It goes back to 1942, and it looks at the seven um, bull markets in gold, and you can see them going from here up to 600 and 800% increases from their base. There have been seven of these periods. Right now, we're this red line. We're about 200. That would suggest if this cycle that we're in is anything like the last seven, that we're going to see a three to four fold increase in the price of, uh, this, of gold and gold shares. Now you might say, all right, well, where are we? Are we close to the bottom? And this is looking at the eight bear cycles that have occurred. And this one in the dark color is the cycle we're in right now. You will notice that it's one of the longest, because you have a time scale here. And it's one of the deepest, in other words, the deepest correction. So from my perspective, it looks like we're at a period where there's little downside risk, not to say there isn't downside risk, but it's been largely taken out of the market. And the upside, which we saw in the slide before, is quite significant. So you may see rotation out of the broad market into a mark section of the market that's been beat up. Uh, Ray Dalio, one of the co-founders of the largest hedge fund in the world back in August said that he felt given the geopolitical events, the economic state around the world, that it would be prudent to have five to 10% of your portfolio in gold. Recently, he bought $600 million worth of uh, GDX, GDL, the gold index. So he's running $165 billion in his hedge fund. So I think the timing's right. If looking at that, there are a number of ways to play the gold market. If you think it's going to go, then you might want to consider a stock that has a very high beta to gold. And MUX is the stock symbol for McEwen Mining. We're listed on the New York and Toronto Stock Exchange. There's, um, we trade on an average daily basis um, just 1.2% of our outstanding shares, which is a reasonably liquid stock. 333 million shares outstanding. Uh, we're trading just, I guess today we're off a bit. We're just under $2. And our beta is one of the highest in the industry. Um, I own 24% of the company. Institutions have another 28. So there's a float of about 50%. Before McEwen Mining, I ran a company, built a company called Gold Corp. And during the 19 years I ran it, um, in the last 13 or so years, we performed very well against Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, the S&P 500, and that's what you're seeing on this graph. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Microsoft, the S&P, the Dow. This is Gold Corp right here. We, our share price grew at a compound annual growth rate in excess of 31%. I was the largest individual shareholder of Gold Corp. This is uh, looking against the universe of senior and intermediate gold stocks. Uh, Newmont, Barrick, Glamis, Meridian, and this is how we performed against them. Clearly outperformed all of them. And that's what I'd like to do with McEwen Mining. I should caution you that that doesn't mean I'm going to do that, but that's my goal. The goal is to get into the S&P 500. There's only one gold stock in it, and I'd like to be one of the next gold stocks in there. 
99% of all the precious metal companies in the world, the public ones, can't get into the S&P 500 because they're not American companies. McEwen Mining is a Colorado incorporated company. And why would you want to get in there? Well, starting with 80% of all the money invested in the public markets in America are represented by the market capitalization of the S&P 500 stocks. There's actually 501. But those 501 companies, their combined market cap represents 80% of all the value in the public markets in the country. Newmont is the only gold stock and it has, so that combined market cap is $2.3 trillion. Newmont's market cap is $20 billion. It's about 0.2 of that number, of 1%. And then you have Freeport McMoran, that's another similar amount. If we see a shift to 1% of the portfolios going into gold, that's a two and a half fold increase in the amount of money flowing into that sector. If it goes to 5%, it'd be 12 and a half times. Right now, the three, com three largest precious metal producers in the country that aren't in that index are Hecla, Coor, and ourselves. Most of the companies out here cannot get into the index. It will provide a more stable shareholder base, a lower cost to capital. And as you've probably all witnessed, the capital markets are changing dramatically in that there's more and more passive investment going on, ETFs and index funds. If you look at all the funds that benchmark to the S&P 500, you're then looking at almost $8 trillion of money. So, uh, significant events for us in the last year. Uh, in October 6th, we bought a property in Timmins, uh, Canada. It's one of the major gold districts in the world. Um, we got a second, we got a permit in Nevada. It took about three and a half years to get it to start our gold bar mine and equipment's moved onto the property and they've started clearing the site to put the plant up uh, two weeks ago. Los Azulis is a, we're gold and silver, but we have a very large copper project and we came out with a preliminary economic assessment that showed a very robust long life asset. And in Mexico where we have a mine, we're transitioning from oxide ore to sulfide, which means a larger processing plant needs to be built. So I'd first like to talk about Timmins. And just to orient you, this dashed line is a geological feature called the Dester Porcupine Fault. In some people's parlance, it's called the Golden Highway. And along this structure, running from the province of Ontario into Quebec, there has been, over the last 100 years, over 125 million ounces of gold produced. In the spring, we purchased some brownfield sites over here on the west side in Timmins, where there's been 70 million ounces of gold produced in the last 100 years. In October, we bought these two areas company and it had a mill with excess capacity that we could process the ore from here and an underground mine here producing 50,000 ounces a year. We didn't buy it for 50,000 ounces a year, we bought it because we thought there was a lot more potential. This is just an outline of the property package. You can see the scale bar down here. In the center is the, where the mine is. You can see some of the grades there in metric, but multi-ounce deposits over good lengths, intercept lengths. Um, there are then satellite deposits on either side, the west side, the east side, that again, very attractive grades. Then we da go down to the bottom of the property. This property is well endowed and I'll tell you what we got when we bought it. We bought it from a firm that had only bought it three years ago. They paid $300 million to buy it. It came, they assumed liabilities 
of another $140 million. And since 2014, they put in a further $120 million. Our purchase price was $35 million. We paid $27.5 million in cash and $7.5 million we assumed in liabilities. You might ask, why, why would someone sell it for that price if they put so much money in? They got pressed to the wall because they had a very bad stream on a Mexican property. They went out and borrowed money. When they invested here, they had their attention distracted to Mexico. There was a strike. It interrupted their cash flow. The Mexican government came back for back taxes. And they said at the beginning of this year uh, to their financial advisors, we'll sell the company or we'll sell any part of the company. We started looking at it in July, came to terms at the end of August and purchased it in October. Now, what we got uh, with our other purchase, we have prime real estate in a very big gold district. And we got 50,000 ounces of production. We got $150 million in tax loss pools to defer the future. Um, and multiple exploration properties. The Timmins purchases increased our measured and indicated resources by over 100% and are inferred by over 300%. I'll move to Gold Bar, which is in Nevada. This is a property that just got permitted. It's $60 million to put it into production. It's right next door to Barracks, biggest gold mine and largest recent discovery. It'll all in costs are about $1,000. Has a six year life, but we think there's more room. In terms of sensitivity, we did a feasibility at $1,150 an ounce, 20% after tax IRR, payback of three years. And right now we're trading in this range. It's a good project. We think there's more room to explore. Uh, some of our initial drilling in the last couple of weeks, these were the best holes we saw in six holes we did. So it's a one gram resource and we're picking up good intersections, slightly better than that. So we think we'll be able to extend it. This is a wild card in our portfolio. It's called Los Azulis. You're looking at a panoramic view of where this deposit is, it's over here, and then it has a long flat valley that can host all the infrastructure. None of this is built. This is in the preliminary economic assessment. It's rare in the Andes to have that. Key features are um, a, a capital cost of 2.4 billion and a payback of that amount in 3.6 years and running for 36 years. Uh, the first 13 years are modeled to be producing 415 million pounds of copper a year at a cost of $1.14. If you were to divide the gold price by the copper price to come up how many ounces of gold, or how many pounds of copper equals an ounce of gold, it's just over 400. So if you converted this to gold, just for the sake of giving you a sense of the magnitude of this deposit, this would be a million ounce gold producer producing at $500 an ounce for 36 years. This is the um, looking, if it was in production today, these are the major copper mines in the world. This is the first 13 years. This is the cost curve. It would be in the bottom quartile of the cost curve. And over the life of the mine, it would be in the bottom um, half. This is just looking at our production coming in under 1,000 on the other two properties. The one we just bought will be 1,000. The one we bought reminds me a lot of Red Lake, which was the driver of Gold Corp. Um, our production curve, our breakdown of silver and gold production. Management team, I'm running, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to quickly go through this. We uh, have 51 million in our treasury. We don't have any debt. We have a yield of half a percent. I'm very against royalties, metal streams, and hedging. Um, I'm the chairman, chief owner. I got a salary increase, I said earlier today. Uh, I'm up to a dollar a year now. By my choice, I get no bonus, no options. 
I've invested after tax $133 million in the company to own 24% of the company. We did an issue in late September. The stock dropped. Uh, as you can see, we're down much more than the GDS. I think we were uh, heavily discounted on that sale, and yet I think we're in the best position we've been to date. And I'm out of time, and I want to thank you very much for listening to McHugh and my name.